to talk today about the open source and uh, its uh, interest in sometimes relationship uh, with the cloud. Let me start by, maybe by uh, stating where I uh, personally uh, come from. Right? I really believe that uh, everything uh, in being equal, the open source uh, is a better choice. The first and foremost is a better choice for you as a customer, as a user of uh, open source, right? I'm not talking about, well, how to make some, you know, big companies to make uh, even more money, but on you as a customer who uses open source, right? Uh, and uh, also that means what from investment standpoint, what you're making with uh, uh, your time, what your organization may be uh, making with uh, its uh, time and money, it is much better to invest in the open source, maybe making that projects which are not yet fit for your use to be uh, you know, better and usable because this way you benefit and everybody in the community benefits. And then you know, if you're just paying your money to Oracle, then guess what happens? Larry just gets to have a bigger boat and not like uh, he, really, uh, he really needs it. Now, if you think about the open source and the commercial software the, uh, the life cycle, right? Uh, I really like this slide, which comes from a presentation by Brooms Momjan, who is a pretty well-known speaker in PostgreSQL community, right? And I think that illustrates not just Postgres and databases, but many other uh, proprietary and open source software as well. Often, we start software as a closed source, right? That's uh, not in every case, but often starts uh, uh, faster and for many years, right, is a superior to functionality until open source alternatives comes about, right? And then if it uh, really gets attraction with all that effort from many individuals and many, uh, uh, and many companies, it becomes superior to their uh, commercial alternative, right, uh, if you like. One of examples in my career, personally, was with Linux. I started with open source when I would say like uh, Linux was just coming of age, right? So I remember that time in the early 90s when some of my elder friends, right, who already had their careers were running HPUX, AX, right, Solaris, some real operating systems, maybe like even like a Windows NT uh, somewhere out there. And I was messing with this toy operating system called Linux. And that was a complete joke, right? It, it was 32-bit operating systems on a 32-bit Intel CPUs. It uh, didn't support uh, multiprocessing mm, pretty well. And you know what? Uh, some of you may not remember that, but you could not even create a file more than two gigabytes in size, right? That was complete joke for, uh, for serious uh, users. And then, well, guess what? Where is Linux now and where is Solaris? Anybody still run Solaris here? Anyone? Uh, oh, yes, yeah, uh, yes, yes. And he volunteers in a, um, you know, computer museum uh, in his town, right? That's why he has to deal with that. Now, I think uh, what you can also think uh, in the same way about their, um, their uh, development frameworks, right? Also, I remember in the time, in the early 2000s, you would have uh, uh, folks who would be using what it was like ASP.NET on something on Windows was kind of very nicely integrated, uh, you know, framework with tool, all the tooling and whatever. And then we, the open source folks, would be, you know, writing Perl, PHP, whatever it was at that time in VI. Or some of us who thought about themselves being smarter would use Emacs. Uh, right, but anyway, that was a completely different experience, right? Now, as we can see, a couple of decades later, we have a very good tooling for any uh, open source uh, language out there, right? I think uh, uh, if you think about that, at least from their you know programming environment, right? Majority of the languages. Uh, which are being in use those days are open source. But if you move that experience to the cloud, though, 
Right now, we can see the uh, kind of a similar experience, right? The clouds like AWS, Google, Azure, whatever, they give us this very nice and well-tendered walled garden of a proprietary solution and services, right? While if you want to venture in this land of the open source, that things become a little bit less integrated, a little bit uh, less usable, right? And actually do require, uh, require more work, right? But if we are to learn from the history, right, we will see what there are improvements to come in the open source uh, uh, infrastructure uh, as it's uh, been uh, developed. Now let me talk a little bit about the open source and its relationship to the cloud. One uh, thing, uh, way you can think about that is what cloud is really makes a lot of open source software easier to use, more polished, and, uh, uh, and so on. For example, if you think, look about at something like uh, Postgres, it's much easier to deploy and manage as something as Amazon RDS or Aurora compared to rolling out your own cluster, dealing with high availability backups, and, uh, and so on and so forth. Now, unfortunately, uh, what we see is uh, what a, lo a lot of the clouds in its relationship to uh, open source follow this well-known strategy which is called ext embrace, extend, extinguish, right? You may uh, learn about uh, that, I think, uh, as uh, I think it's like a well-known strategy taught in a business school those days which pretty much says, hey, you know what? We are going to take this uh, open source uh, product or any kind of open standard. We will kind of extend it in a certain way. And then, guess what? You only stick to our improved version and uh, have uh, uh, you know, nowhere to run. I think in, in databases, it's probably very interesting what you would see besides SQL standard exist. Every database vendor, right, every major database vendors would add their own bells and whistles and encourage you to use them. So you know what? If you became addicted to Oracle SQL variant, there is no freaking way you can live, right? Because you are designed to be a hostage. That's by design, right? Now, I think where a lot, uh, what cloud uh, teaches us though, is about where frontier of that uh, competition is happening. And I think it is about the usability and the ease of use. Frankly, for a lot of software, it became you know, so uh, advanced, you can use uh, you know, a lot of variants. You know, think about databases, programming languages, right? Frankly, if you want to build something, hey, there are probably you know, 10, 15 different choices which you can go about to build uh, the products you need to build, right? But it is a question is what gets uh, uh, you there uh, faster? What is easier? And why is that easier is in particular important right now? Well, one is because over the last, uh, now is you know, a couple of decades, uh, you see absolute explosion of software. You may have heard this term about software is eating the world, right? Or maybe just to think about like how many pieces of software or apps you, in, you uh, interface with of daily, uh, on daily basics compared to let's say maybe 10 years ago, right? The difference is phenomenal. Now, what we see also what the data explosion, the, kind of data we capture, process, a way we process that, you know, uh, amount of those data is also uh, growing explosively, while at the same time, well, people don't scale. We don't produce uh, too many uh, extra people, right, compared to uh, the software growth, and especially uh, people who are uh, very skills, uh, skilled. You have, because of demand, a lot of people going from an industry, not after saying, well, uh, I was interested in computers since my you know, uh, early years. I wrote my first code by the time I was 10, right, and, uh, and whatever, right? But uh, you have a people who essentially move to a career 
of software development after you know, two weeks of JavaScript courses. Right? They need it easy. Easy is the only thing what they, mm, uh, they can use, right? And if we, uh, in the open source community, want them as a users, and then them go into you know, Amazons and Microsofts and other you know, clouds, we need to tailor to their needs, right? Not just you know, look down at them, as I think happens in some uh, open source uh, work communities. What is also interesting, I think, is what we have increased number of uh, people who are getting cloud-only skills, right? And those kind of may be uh, replacing in certain roles the true open source software skills. For example, often you would find somebody say, oh, I am expert PostgreSQL DBA. I know where to click to get my PostgreSQL Aurora cluster on Amazon or maybe on Google, right? And if you ask him, well, okay, that's cool, but do you know how to set up for, you know, highly available cluster with, you know, Patroni, right, and on, you know, Linux outside of a cloud and say, oh, why hell would I, would, uh, would I do that, right? And obviously, if you get people in that cloud-only skills, right, you essentially create uh, uh, create the lock-in uh, for uh, your uh, organization because, well, that is in reality the only thing what they can use. I think that is extended by the policy of uh, many cloud vendors in terms of how they push it and how they educate it. If you guys would take a look at, for example, AWS well-architected framework, right, or the courses, and not just AWS, pretty much any cloud vendor. They would not ever tell you, well, guys, if you need a database, you go ahead and, uh, uh, you know, spin up open source Postgres on EC2. They'll tell you, well, go and use DynamoDB, right, or Redshift, or Amazon Aurora Postgres, right, those things which are maximum uh, uh, proprietary and provide the maximum value for you maybe, but for Amazon or a cloud vendor for certain, right? That is a, a maximum lock-in and a maximum uh, pricing point. Now what is interesting about this pricing point is also it is gradually increased year over year. Now, if you think about RDS, for example, when RDS was just rolled out, they would uh, pro provide a price period of about 40% compared to how much the infrastructure cost. Now, for latest ARM CPUs, right, as I checked, that's more than double. So the point is, what you, uh, if you are uh, uh, adopting their uh, fully managed solution, the price premium you are going to have uh, is uh, likely to continue to, uh, uh, to increase, of course, as we're able to uh, excel more leverage. But also there is one more important point, is what in the clouds, and in particular in a fully managed environment, we also have a lot of organizations becoming addicted to the scaling by the credit card. Because it's so easy, right? And because often that is something what the cloud vendors would recommend. Right? Hey guys, you know what? Things are not fast in, uh, running fast enough. Maybe you know you should tune your queries, add some indexes and whatever. Right? But well, uh, that way you'll be probably asking even uh, you know uh, more <laughs> more questions. Maybe try increasing the instance size first instead. Well, again, I may just be speculating about the motivation, right? But what I can tell you for a fact is what the instances we observe in a cloud, especially in that so-called fully managed environments, are usually kind of tuned absolutely horrible compared to what you'd see in their, uh, uh, let's say, uh, uh, other EC2, right, uh, or on-prem uh, on -prem environments, right, where it's like a question of a skill or something else, right? And in many cases, you would see it's being able to shrunk that instant size and though that's spent very significantly by uh, tuning. And I think what is interesting for the open source is what we actually have two different open source kinds which we see as it uh, relates to a cloud. One is uh, venture funded open source. You know, think about, uh, you know, MongoDB. Elastic, uh, you can think about maybe, uh, you know, HashiCorp recently, 
right? Which all saying, oh my gosh, open source sucks. We just discovered what actually open source empowers other people to compete with us. Oh, that is horrible. Our investors didn't know that. And uh, uh, so maybe we just, uh, you know, ditch that stupid open source license for something else so we can create a, a monopoly for us. Wouldn't that be wonderful? Right? Well, and maybe I'll also uh, try to explain you what that is an open source which gives us all the um, open source benefits, but you all the property software drawbacks is what the new open source should be about. Well, uh, anyway, that is what you often see from uh, their uh, uh, venture funded or other commercial open source company. Now I think another interesting thing is a community driven open source or foundation open source, right? If you think about, you know, Postgres, Kubernetes, Linux, right? A lot of projects in Apache Foundation, CNCF I'm going to talk about, right? I think what is interesting in this case is this community largely embraces the, uh, the cloud uh, because they like the extension of the adoption the cloud gives that uh, to, uh, to their projects, their communities. It's also change who exactly contributes Right, but often the, uh, the contribution to that open source project actually increases as things get adopted in the cloud. Think about Postgres, for example. In a good old days, right, you would have somebody like Enterprise DB employing a lot of PostgreSQL, uh, you know, kernel hackers, right, which would actually work on a core open source project, right? Or well, or Red Hat would be employing a lot of Linux kernels. Now, in both communities, we are having significantly more uh, kernel uh, hackers, right? The PostgreSQL core developers are being employed by cloud vendors, but the investment in uh, those communities is uh, uh, maintained or uh, being increased, right? So there is no that, oh my gosh, cloud is killing our uh, profit things. Next thing uh, I would mention is this interesting trend of a growth of, of uh, any cost in the uh, uh, last decade or so, right? I think we all uh, uh, here um, uh, know about that. The capital was cheap, saying, hey guys, you know, just get there as fast as possible. And what that means is pushing as much stuff to the cloud uh, instead of putting a little bit more elbow grease, what open source often requires inside your organization was uh, their uh, very well, uh, a very well reasonable choice, uh, especially because this uh, subsidized cloud concept, right? You all know what the cloud vendors would uh, give you kind of a free tier, so it's very easy to get started, right? Or if you are a startup, you can get uh, uh, the, your, uh, uh, you know, bunch of uh, cloud credits for free, right? Like as your first dose of heroin, so you can, you know, sufficiently lock in yourself at this given cloud vendor and hopefully if you become successful, you'll be only spending money in that cloud, in the way that cloud educate you. But things, I think, are starting to change. Right, one article I like very much from uh, Anderson Horowitz, right, they have been talking about the cost of a cloud spend compared to the total cost for a uh, number of uh, companies out there, right? And what is interesting here is what you can see, this cost is huge, right? If you are <laughs> want to be profitable, as becomes increasingly important for many companies those days, well, you know, you guys may want to rein in uh, your cloud, uh, uh, cloud spend, right? Now, oops, another interesting trend, uh, I would, uh, what I like is, uh, you may guys know at 30 Signals Company, these are the guys who created Ruby on Rails as well as, you know, generally was a thought leader in the ecosystem. And they, over the last um, couple of years, they published a lot of um, uh, information about, hey, you know what? Cloud is freaking expensive, we are moving the cloud, and how much it costs us. Now, I'm not saying that is a solution for everyone, 
But at least I uh, very much like what there are some thought leaders get in out various alternative ideas. Hey, it is not as you have to rush in the cloud and use the most uh, lock-in services out there. There are other way some companies are exploring and it is working out for them, right? I think that is how the great discussions and how change uh, happens. The next change I would mention here is the GitOps. And why is that important? Well, if you think about the cloud and you say, well, you know what, we go ahead and uh, we deploy something in a couple of clicks, right? That is where a lot of the you know, proprietary clouds are very, uh, very usable. If you think about the G, uh, GitOps and you have this concept of declarative version infrastructure as a code, right, which you have in, uh, in your repository, then guess what? In this case, uh, the open source actually provides a very good experience. Think about the Kubernetes, for example. Well, uh, that's kind of uh, defining your Kubernetes cluster configuration in a declarative fashion and sort of uh, its version is already out there, right? Or uh, the Terraform, what a lot of people use. Again, well, that gives you a way so you can uh, 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 relatively easily move between the different uh, cloud providers, especially if you are you know, sticking to uh, most commodity services. Hybrid cloud is now, I think, is an interesting, uh, interesting trend, which we see what a lot of the larger organizations, they actually, for various needs, have to use more than one cloud or some uh, solutions in the cloud and then on-prem. And what that means is they uh, uh, really try to gravitate to solutions which work everywhere, right? Something like Amazon RDS is easy, but if you have to deal with both Amazon RDS and Google Cloud SQL and uh, uh, you know, Azure solution and then uh, run things on-prem, right, that actually increases your complexity. You would much rather have something, well, you know what, I would rather try to work it, uh, uh, it the same way. Well, and here is where it really coming uh, to this, uh, uh, this choice, if you will. On one extent, we have uh, this solution saying, hey, AWS provides us the, uh, the way how we can log in with a cloud vendor, use proprietary solution, and use this kind of wonderfully, fully featured, highly differentiated cloud, or we can uh, use uh, their open source solution, let's say coming from a cloud native foundation, which comes us with you know, a bunch of uh, other, uh, other benefits. And as you can see, there is a lot of different services, solutions which are now in that open source cloud native uh, environment. What that allows us, I think, is this. Uh, I took this uh, little image about the cloud computing from Amazon presentation, like maybe like 15 years ago, right? Then they compared cloud to the utility. And I think that is a wonderful role for the cloud. Because yes, right, uh, you don't need to rack your service, right? That's kind of uh, inconvenient, right? Same as electricity, you would rather have a computer source, storage source everywhere being kind of instantly available when you need it, uh, right? But at the same time, you want probably your TV, your fridge, your microwave work wherever you get that electricity from, or if you choose to run your generator because you're living off the grid, right? But that is not what Amazon's and the cloud vendors provide you. They essentially say, hey, you buy electricity from us, but you know what? All the other uh, things, they also have to come from us as well. And if you ever want to trade your electricity provider or something else, you have to toss your you know, TV and microwave and your favorite smart fridge. Well, that doesn't make much sense to me. So anyway, uh, I made my case a little bit, and uh, we have this kind of a choices, right? So who here thinks the uh, you know, cloud of serfdom, you know, selling your soul and locking in uh, uh, with cloud has a good idea? Like, anyone? Oh, look at that. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, and what about the cloud of freedom, embracing open source in the cloud? Come on, folks, don't be shy. Oh, look at that. You know, some people are so, so shy, yes. 
Yeah, yeah. You know, on one of his presentation, uh, like uh, I had uh, the guy from Amazon. He says, like, I really like this idea, but you know, I couldn't hand uh, raise my hand because, well, you know, like employment loyalties. Well, uh, anyway, uh, there. Uh, next thing uh, to, uh, to to touch on uh, quickly, uh, and I think I'm running out of time, is where it is. Uh, Mm, what is it based on? One is, of course, uh, uh, Kubernetes. I think uh, with many alternatives came up for years, right? We can see what uh, the, the clear uh, winner has emerged. Kubernetes is uh, available everywhere, uh, right? Those days on all the clouds, on prem, on the edge, uh, wherever. It is also getting better, in particular, for stateless applications, stay full applications, which I am. Uh, care uh, a lot about. Like, for example, one of the recent innovations with your you unified container storage interface allows us to do like a very cool things in Kubernetes in a portable way. We also have in the last few years the doc community has been created. This is a community of people who run uh, their case stands for data on Kubernetes. You know, very, uh, uh, very good, uh, I think. Uh, a very good uh, and growing community. What we also see in terms of CNCF uh, uh, review, right, is there a few years ago there was a question, can you run the database on Kubernetes? Now we can see is what A, uh, like 71% of people are running database on Kubernetes, and that number has grown by 48%. Uh, percent. So I think the Kubernetes and a database in particular are at uh, inflation point, uh, in inflection point. What is also interesting is if you look at database as a service solution by a lot of vendors out there who run uh, recently, they are using the Kubernetes um, uh, as a backend to build their public cloud uh, uh, solution, right? So that uh, means it has to work pretty well, because if not, right, probably those guys would have some uh, other road. Uh, I mentioned Kubernetes is available uh, uh, anywhere. In terms of usability, there is a lot of work in making uh, Kubernetes more usable for people who may be saying, well, you know what, running all that, you know, kubectl fancy command. Yeah. Not what we like to do, providing, let's say, some dashboard, uh, some uh, also GUI tooling around that. We are having some early efforts in getting uh, open source kind of marketplace replacement, right? This is another cool thing about cloud where you can find something, application marketplace, and deploy in a, in a you know, couple of clicks. That is also coming to, uh, you know, to Kubernetes environment. And I think uh, if you look at the other uh, things that we are uh, going to see uh, continuing work in Kubernetes to get us uh, better integrations, better usability, and more seamless uh, day two operations, which are especially important for, uh, for databases. Now, about the databases, few words. That is kind of my uh, background, so I wanted to maybe give that a little bit of a special uh, attention. One war, uh, st uh, quote I like about uh, the data is what the data has the gravity, right? It's kind of hard to move. It tends to attract our applications because where your data is, you probably want often to run applications close to them to minimize latency. But it's also that means that what that creates a severe vendor lock-in. And if you are planning your uh, freedom, then think about data. Think about where you store the data, especially latency uh, uh, sensitive, right? For example, if you are storing your backups on S3, right, or Glacier, that's fantastic, right? Uh, you, it's not very, uh, uh, you know, time sensitive, but if you're running your production database somewhere, well, that will pull a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, applications uh, to them. If you look at uh, uh, Pircona, what we have been uh, working in a lot is uh, uh, providing uh, mission critical the open source uh, and, you know, frankly, source available in case of uh, uh, MongoDB uh, uh, software. Uh, and uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, to Kubernetes cloud native environments, we really have uh, this very uh, mature uh, operators which is a you know, great way to run the databases uh, 
uh, on uh, on the uh, on the Kubernetes, uh, as well as uh, solutions for things like uh, observability and uh, uh, and uh, simplified management, which is specifically focused on uh, uh, on databases, as well as an expertise to count you. Whether we need support, consulting, or managed services. Uh, we got that. That is how we monetize. Like that's how we make uh, money. Uh, we don't have any kind of commercial version of software, which is only available to subscribers. All the software uh, is uh, is open source. And uh, let me finish now with some cool call to actions. If you didn't get, I am going to encourage you to embrace the open source uh, in the cloud uh, when you can. I'm not going to say uh, be open source developer and say, well, you know what, you have to run open source uh, everywhere, right? But I hope I convince you that uh, leaning in more on open source than you can is going to be better for you long term, right? Uh, better for your company. Invest in uh, making it better because the open source is something which uh, which encourage uh, which relies on all of uh, us uh, uh, contributing. Uh, you know, uh, to it, uh, spread the world, and then, of course, uh, run per corner. Oh, I have to say that, or uh, our marketing won't let me to come to those events. Uh, and a couple of uh, other like QR codes for you. One is uh, if you guys are interested in what we're doing in database and Kubernetes, uh, you know, check um, uh, check this. Check this out, and yes, I'm given another five seconds for people uh, taking pictures. And uh, if you guys want to hear more uh, about the open source, uh, uh, you know, databases, maybe a little bit more of those uh, uh, evil company bashing, uh, right? Join us uh, tomorrow for uh, Perconi University in London, uh, taking place, you know, also somewhere here in, in uh, central London. Uh, and with that, that's all I had to say. Uh, thank you, and sorry for slightly running over, and you know, run out and enjoy your break. Thank you.